applies with his trip to Africa. God has opened a, a door supernaturally for him to, to go to Kenya, right, in May. Um, it's amazing. Uh, he's been on the radio. Uh, I think there was, what, two and a half to three million listeners? Went all through the nation, and God is using him mightily. Amen? And so um, when you give, and when you, we've given to that mission for him to go, we have a little part of that of a reward in heaven of the souls that got saved, the souls that got touched. We're a missions-oriented church. We always will be, as long as I'm behind the pulpit anyway. And so, uh, praise God. Brother Mike, will you come and just share with us what's on your heart? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Boy, that was weak. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. No, come on, you can do better than that. Y'all awake this morning. You should be after that worship. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Don't get quiet. Praise God. <clears throat> For a minute, <laughs> when we were worshiping God, I felt like I was back in Africa. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's wonderful. The presence of God. There's nothing like the presence of God. Amen. God can do more <laughs> in just a moment in his presence than we could ever do in a lifetime. One moment with Jesus is all that it takes. Amen. Hallelujah. To change your life. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. I want to share a passage of scripture with you. We're going to read it together this morning uh, from Philippians chapter 3. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Praise his name. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. It's wonderful to be in the house, but it's even more wonderful when God is in the house. <laughs> and I'd rather have God in the house. Hallelujah. I've been in a lot of houses. <laughs> and some may have his name on the sign or on the door, but he wasn't there. <clears throat> and then in other places, you walk in and there he is. Hallelujah. I'd rather be in the presence of God. Bless, bless the name of the Lord. Praise his holy name. If we go down to the 10th verse, my brother. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <clears throat> Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. <clears throat> God really brought this passage of Scripture to reality for me in this last trip. I mean, I had read it before. I had, had thought that I knew. But like my sister was saying this morning, when every time you go into the presence of God, he, he gives you something, even though you may have read it a million times, heard it a million times, yet that one time when you go in, God reveals something completely new. He totally transforms and changes the word because it's alive. Hallelujah. And it is alive. And I found this passage of scripture to be so alive. I walked and I'm beginning to walk and to realize and to, and to know the word in intimacy like you talked about. I love the word of God. I feel like you, man, if there were time, I could, I could just eat it. God, just eat it so that it's there, so that it's a part of me. And that's what he told the, the prophet to do. Take the scroll and eat it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I guess we're right in line. So we're going to eat together this morning. Hallelujah. 
Pull up your place at the table. God has put table, prepared a table before us this morning. Hallelujah. Are you ready to eat? Amen. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Feasting on the riches of his grace. Praise his holy name. Paul says, just before this verse, he said, listen, everything else means nothing to me. I'm paraphrasing. I count all things as dung, as if they were refuse, as if they were worthless. Everything else means nothing. This one thing is all that matters, that I may know him, that I may be found in him. Not in my own strength, not in my own power, not walking according to my righteousness that I thought I knew as I walked in the law. That's Paul. But his righteousness, walking in his power, in his glory, in his grace. He says, comes down to verse 10, that I may know him. This is the whole crux of Paul's ministry. And the Spirit is speaking this morning to us. Do you know him? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That I may share together with him in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. Hallelujah. Father, this morning our hearts are burning within us. Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you for meeting with us as we worshiped you this morning, Lord God. And you're here. We feel you. We sense you. We know, Father, my spirit's alive within me. My brother looked down and he said to me, what do we do? <laughs> Father, I feel like that right now. What do I do, God? Because you're so real. Your presence is here. We thank you. We praise you, God, that you have blessed us this morning by coming into this place so that we can meet together with you, Lord God, and be changed Everything else this morning we count as nothing but only to know you, to be touched by you, to meet with you, to encounter you, Lord God, and be changed by a revelation of your glory. Your presence is all that we need. Father, this morning, speak into our spirits. Breathe upon us fresh revelation from your word that we might be changed. That we might go forth from this place empowered, on fire, with hearts that burn anew with a revelation of who you are and what you desire for us. what you are calling us to and what you're desiring to do for each and every one of us to be everything that you have called us to be. For your honor and for your glory this morning, Jesus. And if you believe the word this morning, say amen. amen. I agree. Hallelujah. Do it in me, Jesus. Three weeks before I left to go, on the, the trip that I just returned from, I was taken back into the presence of God. You know, we had been praying for some time, Monday nights and all of the rest, and I had been going into the presence of God, but something happened about three weeks before I was getting ready to leave. I did the Daniel kind of thing, you know. And something happens sometimes when, you know. <laughs> and, and, but God led me into this 
this special place in his presence, and I, was, I found myself broken again. Anybody ever know what that feels like? Where, when you just break in his presence. It, it seemed like every time I, I went before him, it was boom. <laughs> you know, and you're emptied, and you're poured out, and, you're, and all you can do is cry. Sometimes you can't even get words out. It's just, God, you're breaking me. I feel you. You're doing something inside me. Something's happening. Something's changing. Your word is alive in me like never before. <clears throat> and I had an awareness of God in his presence. And a quickening by his word. And this passage of scripture, I began to, to think on this passage of scripture. What does it really mean? Lord God, take me to that place. I don't want to just know these words in my mind. I want to walk these words. I want to live these words. I want this word to be alive in me. Amen. This is my experience, God. I don't want to read just the experience of the apostles and the prophets. I want to be. Amen. I want to walk in. I want to know you. I want to say like Paul. When everything comes down to the end, everything else is done. There's only one thing that really matters, that I may know him. I may know him. And that's a dangerous prayer to pray. And I found that out. <laughs> if I didn't know it already, I, I found it out uh, anew and afresh. Because there is a baptism of suffering that's really good for you <clears throat> because it takes you to a different place. It's a place of consecration and sanctification. It's a place where you do business really with God. And you have to go through it <clears throat> because it's really dying to yourself, dying to your flesh, dying to your own desires, your own will, your own aspirations, and whatever you think, whatever you feel, your preconceived notions and ideas, everything falls by the wayside. Amen. Everything else just, just crumbles. And all that you're left with is God, that I may know you and be found in you. So you can't get to the place of resurrection power and walking in power and authority in the, and know the, the power of the resurrection and the anointing. And everybody talks about the anointing. Oh, I want the anointing. You really want the anointing? Are you really willing to go? To the place in order to receive the anointing? You want to die? Because you got to die before you live. In order to face resurrection, you got to be dead first. You can't be resurrected if you're, if you're alive. <laughs> you got to die first. And what Paul is saying is, you got to die to the world. You gotta die to the flesh. You gotta die to your own desires, your own aspirations, the way you used to think. He said in this passage of scripture, listen, I used to think a certain way according to the law. And I thought it was good. I thought I was doing the will of God because it was rules and regulations and scripture, I thought. But then I met him and I encountered him and it completely changed me. And I realized that everything else that I thought I knew when I came into his presence, it all melted away when I saw him and encountered him. And that's what he's talking about here. That I may know him, but first I've got to be conformed to his death. Like Jesus who took the cup the night before he 
uh, that night that he was betrayed, you know, in the garden, before he went to the cross, Lord, if it's possible, because he knew what lay ahead. He knew they were coming to arrest him, to beat him. He knew he'd have to go to trial. He knew he would be falsely accused. He knew they would shamefully beat him, spit upon him. He who created all of this, he comes to his own, his own creation, and he submits himself to be ridiculed, to be shamed, to be beaten, to be abused, and suffer death, the cruelest death that mankind has ever known. Most torturous and agonizing death at the hands of sinful men. Hand it over to demons. Read Psalms. Oh, boy. The dogs, he says, they encompass round about me. He's talking about demon hordes, forces of darkness, who took advantage in that moment when he said, Lord, not my will, but yours. Help me, Jesus, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but yours. That's the attitude of Christ. He who knew no sin, no guile, submitted himself and gave himself because he knew there was no other way for you and I to be saved. He had to shed spotless, sinless blood. The sacrifice had to be a pure sacrifice. And there was only one who fit the bill. Nobody else could pay the price for our sin and our separation from God. He alone paid the price. And Paul said, I saw him and I knew him. This resurrected one, but I knew him first in his suffering. And nobody faced it like Paul. Read the life of Paul. I don't know how these modern-day preachers, I don't know where they get their, their mindset from. I don't understand modern-day theology, if that's what you even want to call it. I don't even want to call it theology because it has nothing really to do with God. This modern day where they, you know, everything that seems negative, you just, oh, cast it aside. Well, I don't know any suffering that's positive. It produces positive outcome in us, but while you're going through, hello? Is it pleasant? Is it pleasing? No. Does it hurt? Yeah. But let patience have her perfect work. I'll never forget, God spoke that word to me, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Because you know how you get patience, and I'm like, I'm not praying it. I am not praying for it. <laughs> You're going to do it in me anyway, I know. <laughs> I'm not praying for it. <laughs> but let her have her perfect work. Because it produces in you. The sufferings of Christ produce something in you. Every time he's beaten, Paul is praising God. Every time he's in prison, Paul is thanking God. Every opportunity. I said opportunity. Every opposition was an opportunity for him to become more like Jesus. To learn something in the midst of his suffering, and we think we go through. Have you read the life of Paul, of the disciples, of the early believers? 
And we're praying for prosperity. And we're praying, oh, God, give me easy life. Oh, Lord, bless me, bless me. I'm so, God, help me. God, help me. Because that is so foreign to a real disciple of Christ. That mindset and that attitude where we're supposed to, you know, be all millionaires. Well, if we're supposed to, I don't know what happened. I missed that boat, bro. <laughs> that we really missed it, man. I don't know if there was a plane, if it was a boat, whatever it was, we really missed it. I got on the wrong, wrong, <laughs> the wrong train, bro. Because uh, my mind is not headed in that direction. I have not been in that direction. I've never been in that direction. I don't know where these guys are coming from. I really don't. That's a totally different mindset to me. When I read God's word, this is what God desires. All of the trial, all of the testing, all of the tribulation, with everything that he faced, he looks down the corner of time into my day and says, in that day, troublesome times. 
In that day, those are going to be difficult times because men are going to be lovers of themselves. They're going to be far from me in their mindset. They're only going to want to please their flesh. And it's sad because he's talking not just about the world. The sad fact is that he's talking to the church. Lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. He looks down the corridor in this day, this time, the day I find myself, the day you find yourself, our day, our time, today. And he said, boy, those are troublesome times, difficult times, challenging times. And you've got to know him. You've got to be able to hear his voice. You've got to be able to walk outside of yourself. Especially, man, it's, it's, it becomes real. If it wasn't already, it really becomes real when you leave here. And you begin to walk. When God calls you to another... When, when I knew it was real on the plane, just before I was getting ready to touch down, when the stewardess, oh, well, they don't call them stewardess anymore. <laughs> you know, they, that's, I'm showing my age, sorry. When the flight attendant comes and says, you know what, I, I was the very last person, the very last seat, <laughs> at the very end of the plane, they put me right in the, <laughs> I was in the back, man, just before you go into the galley. And the two seats beside me were empty. And I thought, well, this is cool because I can rest and I can relax and, you know, what I, I can put my feet up, whatever. And it was. It was really a blessing. But because I was in the last seat, she had served everybody else their coffee and all of the rest. And she went back and she said, I just put a fresh pot and it's piping hot and I'll bring it out to you. And I thought, and, I, and me, I love coffee. I really do. I, well, I used to love coffee. <laughs> no, I really, I really, I love a good cup of coffee. And I was excited. But this was Turkish Airlines, and so I knew, oh, I'm going to get some Turkish coffee, which is really good. I had it once before. So I was looking forward to that. I'm like, yeah. And just as she came with this piping hot pot and took the cup and stood there and poured it, that cup just slipped from her hand. And I wore that coffee all here. And it, the minute it hit me, it burned. And my clothes began to stick to me. And there was immediate, I mean, I was in pain. That thing, to say that it burned, that it hurt, that it was pain, no. <laughs> was beyond that, I wanted to jump out the plane. No, really. I have never been burnt like that. And I thought, oh, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, ice. <laughs> I just looked at her and I said, ice. And she comes with this bag. And I'm like, perfect. Chum. And I pull the shirt, you know, away from my skin and I put it up in there. And within like, it seemed like within seconds that thing was just melted. It was so hot. And I, and I went into the bathroom, and I looked, and it was beet red. I mean, it was red, redder than this, and it was beginning to blister. There were these yellow, you know those. My skin began, you know, I saw it with my own eyes, and I thought, oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, God, no. And I said, one more bag. <laughs> and, and I was crying, man, because it hurt. You ever burn yourself anywhere? It's not a pleasant experience. And this was all over my abdomen. From here down, the whole thing was burnt. And I took that ice and I put it in there. 
And I went back into the bathroom and I said, no, Satan, in the name of Jesus. And I was screaming to the top of my lungs. Now, this is Tur Turkish Airlines. <laughs> They're all Muslims. But in that moment, I did not care. I was going to get a hold of God. And I wanted everybody, I didn't care who heard. When I came out of that, the, the whole back of the plane, they all look at <laughs> Like, what in the world happened to this guy? Something happened in that bathroom, I'll tell you. In the midst of the fire, I met him. He was there. And I put that ice, and I prayed, and I said, No, you didn't bring me here for this. And I came out, and I said, One more bag. <laughs> Two bags I went through. And the pain was excruciating. And I'm thinking, Jesus, if you don't help me, I'm done. Because the guy is saying, we, we need to take you to the hospital. Because they have to. You know, because I had the insurance and all the rest. They had to take me. They can get sued, bro. If, if, if I don't allow them to treat me medically, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the truth. Anybody who's ever traveled, you know, man. They are responsible. It's, it's their neck on the line. It's their job on the line. And they don't want to, the airline does not want to get sued, especially by an American on a Turkish airline. <laughs> but I took that ice, and I went back in there, and I prayed like I never prayed in my life. In the name of Jesus! And I'm shouting just like I'm shouting right here, right now, and I didn't care who heard me because I was in pain. And I needed him. Jesus, this is not happening. Not today, devil. And I said, no, you will not keep me from what God has for me. I am not going to be done. This too. If I have to go there burnt, I'm going there burnt. You're not going to stop me from preaching your word. No, sir. No, sir. And that bag all of a sudden something happened and I took that third bag three there's something about three bro brother <laughs> there's something about the third bag <laughs> after the third bag man I, I was in the bath and I took that thing off and my skin was pink it had gone from blistered to bright red to now now it's pink and I'm like oh Jesus pink like that, pink. <laughs> like that, pink. And I'm like, pink is better. Pink is better. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, Jesus, what do I do? And I'm crying. And everybody heard me. And they came. She says, Pastor. <laughs> you know, she comes. I'm like, oh, now you're going to call me. Cause they, no, I didn't tell anybody who I was, what I was doing there, but they all knew it after I got out of that bath because I announced to the whole plane and everybody within a 10 mile radius of that plane why I was there. And I, <laughs> and I walked out and, and I went to the back in, into the little galley area. And uh, the other man, I call him a brother, he was wonderful, comes running and he has this big tube of ointment stuff and he says, put, put as much of this on there as you can. And then he, he's going to take, we'll take you to the hospital and da 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 And I'm like, no, I'm going to be fine. I said, the pain has stopped. And I said, give me that. I'll anoint myself with all that. <laughs> I did. I anointed myself with whatever that, that stuff was. I put it all on there. And I said, no, I'm going to be fine. And so she came. And she says, are you, are you comfy? She says, don't worry about putting the seatbelt. Because, you know, they're getting ready to land. It's like 20 minutes, and they're going to touch down. And I'm like, so where's my coffee? I said to her, <laughs> I said, you insane. <laughs> and, yeah, make sure you pour it back there, but, you know, and put it here. Put it on this. I'll sit in the middle, put it here. <laughs> You know, and, I, and then she gives me this whole roll because I was like soaking wet and I was like, my clothes were stained with coffee and all this. So I took, she brought this whole roll of paper towel and I just brum, brum, put it up and I, and I, and thank God I was wearing that, that stuff, that dry stuff, dry, whatever it is, that fabric that, that, you know, 
takes the moisture away from you in this. Well, guess what? It works. It actually works. And so I used it, but that whole roll of paper towel helped. <clears throat> I sopped up the water, and I got all of that. And by the time I reached the ground, my skin was perfect, except for one little spot. I had about a two-inch spot at the very bottom of my abdomen, and I said, that's just a reminder for the power of God. <laughs> and when I got on the ground, I showed my brother. I said, you see this? What did you do? And I said, you don't even know. <laughs> I said, this is a reminder to me of God's power. This is why I'm here. And I, suddenly this passage of Scripture became very real to me. If I didn't know before, I suddenly realized, wow, we're walking in a different place. This is, this is different. And that was my introduction. As I landed in Dar es Salaam, and what I faced from that moment, four times the enemy tried to take my life. I was in a major accident on the back of a motorcycle with my brother. And we should not have made it through, but we were standing and everybody else was on the ground. And everything stopped and we were in the middle of six lanes of truck. Eight, I think it was two, four, six, eight. In the, in the middle of an intersection between two buses because they're crazy over there and don't know how to drive. <laughs> and we were on the back, the two of us. I'm in the middle after the driver, and the driver jumped off. <laughs> and I'm like, bro, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> and I'm like, in the name of Jesus, shut the love of Everything stopped. Everything stopped. We ran into another motorcycle. And a woman in the back jumped while well, she was thrown off the back of the motorcycle. And I saw the guy's eyes, and he's like, uh-oh. And I closed my eyes and I said, oh, this is going to hurt. Because I'm like, Ugh. And we, the, the motorcycle stalled just as we hit. Everything stopped. Everybody stopped. Trucks, everything came to a halt. And everything was, like, for a few seconds, everything was quiet. And I, and I was just like, are we in heaven? <laughs> I'm looking at my brother who's behind me, and he's, oh, brother, you okay, bro? You okay? And I'm like, I think so. <laughs> we're alive, man, and we were on our feet. On the bike, on the motorcycle, we were on our feet. And I said, where'd the driver go? And he's over there, and the woman is over there. And, the, and I'm like, whoa, and people are out of their cars looking like, what? We should not have been here. And how do you walk away from that? And then everybody just got back on the motorcycle in their cars. They're like, like oh, well, nothing to see here. And they, everybody went on their way, and we went off. And I was like, what did you just, what just happened? What just happened? Someone pushed me. We went to go. I ended up on a 16-hour bus that went from Dar es Salaam all the way to Umbaya, where I was supposed to be, because they tripled the price of the, air, the, air, the flight that I had already been booked on at a much discount rate. And as soon as they saw that I was white and Western, they immediately saw dollar signs and the price went up times four. Reality. And I realized, hmm, I guess we're not flying there. <laughs> and then got on a bus. And so on our way to the bus, to get the tickets and reservation and all of that to have in hand, because you can't just trust people. <laughs> Everything has to be in your hand, you know, and paid for in advance. On our way there, if we had come to the bus, the depot, thousands of people are there. Multitude. It's the end of the day by the time we are there to, to get tickets for the next morning. We had to be there at 5.30 a.m. And here's after 8 at night because we had gone that whole way. And that was a whole different, that was a whole different situation. But I'm going with my brother. He's like, don't let go of my hand. Hold on to me because there are thousands. And as soon as they see me, hello, I'm the only white person within probably half of that country. There's nobody else around. It's a sea of just black, <laughs> really dark brothers and sisters, <laughs> and, and me. 
in the middle, like a light bulb <laughs> shining in the midst. I'm like, Lord, if you don't stand out. <laughs> He's like, don't let go of my hand because they'll take you, brother. <laughs> because they think you, because you're white, you're from the West. Hello, like they don't know I'm from the West. I, they knew I wasn't from there. <laughs> they'll just take you and take your money and leave you wherever. They don't care. That's some of the mindset because there are robbers and thieves and all of that there. And the enemy of our soul is lurking. So I was holding on to my brother's hair for dear life. Right behind him, going through the crowd, and everybody's pushing at us and clawing. Oh, come here, come here. Oh, you want a ride? You want a ride? You want a ride? You know. Well, I'll give you a ride. Yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> but I don't want a ride there. Hello. <clears throat> and I'm holding on to my brother's hand, and we go over this little hill and, 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 and down a little embankment, and as just as I got to the top of the hill, I was pushed, shoved from behind, and I ended up letting go of my brother's hand and passing him, just flying, really, like I see him and, and I'm like flying over, my feet are up in the air, I'm face long, headed for a pile of rocks. And I'm thinking to myself, this is really going to hurt. <laughs> and I am about... I closed my eyes, and all I could say is, Jesus. And, and just as I'm ready, I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to be fun. I didn't even have time to react, brother. I just, boom. And all of a sudden, it was as if I felt these arms. Somebody grabbed me around the waist, set me up on my feet, and held on to me. And I'm looking, but there was nobody there. I'm like, I can feel you behind me. You are big, and you are strong, and you're holding on to me. I feel you, but I can't see you. There's nobody there. And I'm shaking. I'm going up. And everybody comes running. What's up? And they're looking at me, and my brother said, what? <laughs> He's like, brother, he said, I saw you fly by. And I saw because there's a stone wall and then there's these big pile of rocks because it's not finished. Big rocks. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to be good. <clears throat> and he said, all of a sudden, man, you're on your feet? What happened? And I'm like, how do you explain that? I don't know. Somebody big, somebody strong. Because I felt them and those arms. I felt them. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, man. He's like, Is, are we done? <laughs> He's like, the plane, the accident. The, I'm like, I, I can't make any promises, bro. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> Let's just go home. <laughs> I'm telling you. And there was one other situation that I'll share with you. Coming back, and I wasn't the only one to face. Everybody who was called to that conference, my brothers who came from Malawi, were coming through Chichipi. You have to go over a mountain pass on, by bus. They were coming, it's about three and a half or four hours from Chitipa in Malawi to where the conference was in Umbea. And so you have to go over the mountain pass and uh, as they were coming down off of the mountain, the bus, the, the engine blew. And, and it caught on fire, and they narrowly escaped within their life, with their life. As they were traveling to the conference, and he said, he said how nobody was hurt. Miraculously, they lost everything. Because it, it burnt. The bus burnt. Everything in it burnt. Couple chickens made it. <laughs> but everything burnt. They lost luggage, everything. Everything. He said, I grabbed my Bible. He said, Thank God, Pastor Mike, I have my Bible with me. I'm like, Praise God. 
And he said, but you wouldn't believe. That's why I'm, I, we're there for an entire day. And I'm like, where are they? They got there the next day because they had to wait. By the time they got another bus and the whole bit, it's, it's the next day. This is why we're late, Pastor Mike. Oh, my Lord. And I'm thinking, yeah, I kind of know. I think we got the same tickets, bro. <laughs> I was on that train. <clears throat> they faced the same thing. My brother was called from the conference to go back because he works for the government. TBC International, the, the journals, the journalists, the, the airwaves, the television, all of that, it's all government controlled. If you want to think, if you think that government control is wonderful, think again. Because you're at that beck, their beck and call. And he said, I have to, you don't understand, Pastor, I can't tell them no. And so he said, I have to leave. And I'm like, you got, you got to leave. That means I have to go home alone on a 16-hour bus ride. Alone. And I did not want to go alone. <clears throat> Coming back on that bus, they stop, you know, so that you can use the facilities and all, what they call facilities. <laughs> is a whole different, <laughs> let me tell you, <laughs> well, your idea of a rest stop and mine are two different things. But I had to go, man. I really had to go. And so I'm like, ugh. And there are all kinds, I mean, thousands of people here. Buses lined up. There was a, must have been 20 buses. And they're coming from everywhere. And they're stopping. This was a popular place. And there was food. And there was, you know, all this other stuff. And I'm like, just bathroom, bathroom. Get me to the bathroom. And I'm like, and I came off that bus and I came down just going to run into the bathroom. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, I didn't even think to, to remember where the, where the heck is the bus. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, help me. Because how am I ever going to find my way back? And, and it's wall to wall people. And everybody's looking at me like, who is this guy? You know, because <clears throat> I am not... Mm. I'm not dressed like they are. There were a lot of guys in turbans and, and things and robes and all of this because it's a Muslim country. <clears throat> and a lot of these facilities are, are run by Muslims. And, and, <clears throat> and so they're all around us. And so I knew I was in hostile territory. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, just get me to there and back. Lord Jesus, you said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. <laughs> and, and he was there every step of the way, and so I came, I went into the rest, I found the restroom, and it wasn't bad, actually, and I came out, and as soon as I came out of the door, this man grabbed me, and he's speaking another language, you know, Arabic, and he grabbed me, grabbed me by the arm, and he's saying, you know, money, 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 and I'm like, I don't have no money, and I, and I pulled myself away, and I see these other guys behind him, and I thought, if you don't run now, you're not going to get out of here alive. I didn't have money. <laughs> I really didn't have any money with me. Purposely, I gave everything to my brother. to And I said, no, I don't want to carry nothing with me, just in case, you know. <clears throat> and so, and all of a sudden, man, I'm, I, I ran and I'm thinking, oh, my God, where do I go? And this man came out of nowhere and he grabbed my hand. And he ran, and he's, and he's running. He says, come on, and running. And I'm like, you speak English. <laughs> and we're running. And we turn the, the thing to the bus, and he pulls me up, and he says, this is your bus. And he pushes me, and he pushes me up into the bus. And I got up into the bus, and I turn around to thank him, and I'm gone. Where did he go? And I'm like, and the, and the, and the driver is saying, get in your seat. Because they know. They know these guys are coming. Get in your seat. Get in the back of the bus and sit. And I did. And I'm praising God and thanking God. And I'm like, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> and that's what you walk in. And that's what you walk through. But what we encountered and experienced in our time there, oh my God. God's word they tell me the Chitipa Choir was there. 
uh, brothers and sisters from Malawi. And uh, this sister came up to me and she said, Pastor Mike, you know, two years, because they were with me when I was in the crusade into, into the early. Two years ago, when you, you didn't preach like that. Something happened to you. I'm like, you don't know what happened to me. <laughs> Little do you know. How, but I'll tell you, I preached like I've never preached in my life. The word of God came, I'm telling you, and God all by himself. Things happened in those services. You know, I didn't have to lay hands on anybody. People were healed and delivered. Demons were coming out and all of it. And I didn't lay hands on nobody. I prophesied over two individuals. That's it. And they were in the worship team. And I prayed from the platform with my brother over this which you'll see in just a minute. But what God did and how he moved and these people just broke in the presence of God. And God's anointing and his power visited us. And we encountered him in that place. So much so, we get to the last service on Sunday morning and God had moved through our entire time there. And I had no idea the numbers of people's lives that were changed and all of this, and I'm like, God, you know. It's recorded in heaven, everything that has happened. And, it, and it's impossible to, to even put into words to try and to tell you what took place there. Because it, it was un unbelievable what we encountered, what we faced, what we felt. God's presence and his anointing in that place. It was overwhelming. I found myself at times weeping in the middle of my sermon and just falling in the presence of God during their worship because Africans have this, this tribal spirit, this warrior-like spirit. When they worship, when they pray, anything they do, is we're, they're not like Americans. They do business when they get in the presence of God. You get them touched by Jesus. You have, give them an encounter with him, and, and you have lit something on fire, and they burn. And they give their all. They have nothing else. There are no distractions there. There are no luxuries to speak of. You wouldn't want to just go and hang out there. You wouldn't be comfortable. Especially if you saw those rest stops. <laughs> you would not desire that. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the presence and the power and the anointing of God was phenomenal. And so I, I knew what Paul was talking about. I had an inkling in my spirit. And, and I love this. Verse 12. Not as though I had already obtained this. This resurrection power. This anointing, this glory, walking in the presence and anointing of God. Not as though I had, I had exhausted this resource or come to know him because God is unfathomable. The more you think you know him, the more you realize, I don't. Because every time you get into the presence of God, he reveals something new and something fresh. And what you thought you knew, he just blew the lid off. And that's the way it is within the presence of God. With the, the angels who are there, you know how Isaiah says they cry one to another, holy, holy, holy. They're not singing a, a hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. No, they're not singing a hymn. They're not, they're, they're not even, they're just reacting to the presence of God. Holy as God reveals himself in that moment to them, that's all they can do is cry, holy! When God, is re as he reveals himself over and over and over again, they never tire. And that's all they do, cry out one to another, holy! 
Holy, there's no other way to describe him. They cry out. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. And Paul says, how could I ever obtain this? <laughs> not as though I'd already attained or I'm already perfected. And that word is not the perfect that you think. That word perfect literally means to obtain that which you are seeking after, longing after, hoping for. That which I've longed for, that's what I've prayed for, that, that has been the longing inside of me. I've not come to that knowledge yet, but I'm pressing on, I'm pressing in, and the more that I see, the more I desire the more that I get into his presence, the more I want him. This is what Paul's saying. The more I desire. He said, I press. I press. I press on to make him my own. The, the King James says, I'm not... <coughs> yet apprehended that for which Jesus apprehended me. But I like the way that this version, go back. <laughs> yeah, there, that's right. That's, that's King James. You saw it right there. Amen. Uh, but I like this. I press on to make this my own because Jesus has made me his own. And I desire to be like him. I long for him. I desire him so much. I want to be like him. And I'm pressing on. I'm pressing in. I'm pursuing after him with everything that's within me. Until I break through. Although I'll never really break through. And I'll never really apprehend. But I press. And I long. And I push. And I desire. Ah. Oh, because I am his, and he is mine, and I just want to know him. <sighs> Hallelujah. So, brothers, I don't consider, verse, verse uh, 13, that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do. Doesn't matter what I went through. Doesn't really matter, matter everything else that I face. The sufferings of this present day are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. In us. Not to us. In us. That's his glory. His power revealed in me. Forgetting those things that are behind and straining forward, pressing in. I press toward the mark. I strain forward to what lies ahead. And verse 14. Pressing on toward the goal. The prize. Everything I do. He says now. This is the goal. This is the key. The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the longing and the desire. This is what fuels the fire inside of me. Not that I could ever break through and really obtain, but man, I get as close, as close, and as close as I can. And I desire him more than I desire anything else. And there's a prize because I get him. I get him. Hallelujah. He's the prize. He's the prize. He's the goal. I get him. I'm found in him. So let the pictures roll, brother. <laughs> you can start those, start those pictures uh, and you can see 
Uh, yeah, this is a, this, man, we had explosive time. They, they run to the altar uh, when they come. They run to the, the, the presence of God. They run to the altar. And all you can see is people. <laughs> and and uh, they're crying out to God. They're praying here. And, and uh, they're not quiet when they pray. And they are very expressive to God when they cry out to him. You can just play them. There you go. They're on their faces there. I mean, we, we experienced it all. We experienced it all in that place. They like to press in. They want to get as close to you as possible. <laughs> and uh, this is outside. And there's a whole lot of people. And I don't know how many, couple thousand or how many ever were there. Somebody told me four or five thousand. I don't know. But <clears throat> you really can't tell by some, from some of these pictures and this and that. This is in uh, the bus getting ready to go <laughs> with my brother. We're waiting as the, you know, in the bus terminal to go. Uh, and this is another brother. I call him a brother. He's not yet a brother. But he was sitting next to me on the other side. And uh, his name is Tony. And uh, he's, he's a Muslim. And he, he shared his life with me on that. Well, you're 16 hours on a bus. We, uh, we had a lot of time to talk. And, and he shared he's an orphan. And he was orphaned as a child because his parents, he, he comes from Rwanda. And in the genocide that took place there, his parents were, were killed. And so he was left there, and he has only an uncle who is alive. Uh, and so he has no family to speak of. And he's been on his own since, I don't know, whatever, however old he was. And uh, he shared to me he's a chef and, and working and all of this. And, and, you know, a remarkable man. I mean, I'm telling you, his, his story riveted me. And these are some of the brothers who had come to be with us. It's, an, it's another choir. And, uh, and this is my brother Matthew, uh, who is head of the Jatipa worship team, and he was there with me. And uh, we are praying together, and, and I'm speaking a word to him there. And that's my African shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my brother Albert, his, his parents, his mom, his dad, his younger brother, and his family was there, and they were with us for the last day of the conference. And that's my brother Matthew, who's in Bible school and, and uh, desiring. And this is another gentleman who is the head of another worship team, another choir that was there. And I wish you could see the clothes, man. They had the, the shirts and things that they wore. I'm like, what's your size, bro? <laughs> And this is Bishop Mamlima, my good friend from Malawi. He and his son Franklin right here, together with Matthew and, and, and Tiki, these brothers were on the bus that caught fire. Uh, and so this is my brother. This boy can sing. Let me tell you, he has an anointing on his life. And when he leads in worship, the presence of God just comes down. And uh, he sang there. These are my brothers and I. Uh, and we just ate up our time, you know, taking pictures and all of the rest. <laughs> and um, this is this is this is this is Tanzanian coffee. Look at that mug. Listen, if you're gonna go for it, you, you go for it, brother. I, that's my that's my take. If I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And that's honey. And that's unleavened bread that we found. This woman was making unleavened bread. And so we, we snagged some, and we brought it back, um, and we had hard-boiled eggs and bananas and some other fruit, and there was pineapple and all kind of stuff there. And we were celebrating Hanukkah together, my brother and I. We were celebrating as we were there uh, and enjoying our time together. And that's TBC International. Uh, I had opportunity to, to speak over the radio uh, and even over the television, and I didn't know it. Um, while I was there. This is in the radio station, in the radio studio. TBC International, and it was a miracle because this is a government-run station. 
<laughs> and uh, they have an audience nationally of more than 40 million. And, uh, but TBC is an international broadcast because they, they broadcast these uh, football games, soccer, soccer games. And they go to all the world. And you can get them on, you know, if you hook into the internet, you can hear them. My sister in New York heard me preach. And my brothers in, in Brazil heard me preach uh, when I was there on the radio for those times. So you have an, a worldwide audience of more than 100 million. Uh, and so, and I know they heard it all the way here uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning or whatever it was because I had to get up. I, I was at my home and we, we streamed because thanks, thank God to my brother over here told me how to do it. Uh, and, I, and I streamed from my living room. <clears throat> and uh, I was dressed from here, and then I had my pajamas. And, and I preached the word. <laughs> At 3 o'clock in the morning, I got up to preach the word over, you know, on, the, on uh, my internet and, and so that my brothers could hear it live. I was live there. <laughs> And that was the second time that I, I streamed live, uh, actually there. And so I actually ended up doing four, four different broadcasts and, and four different times, which they aired multiple times uh, after I had gone. And then uh, now my brother works. He does such a wonderful job at the radio. They, they brought him into the TV station. And now he has access to television. So I said, oh, Lord, what do you have in mind? God is an amazing God. And uh, you never know when you walk before him what he's going to do, where he's going to take you to, what he's going to do, how he's going to use you. Uh, but it's amazing. Really, really amazing. Man, I wish you could have been there at that service. It was crazy. It, oh. It's crazy, and this is part of that, um, where we were, it's, it's kind of difficult to explain because this one, one section goes this way, and I'm over on the, the side, and another section goes the other way, that way, and it's open on the end over here, and it's open all the way there at the end, and then there's another section over there that's open because there's a park there and a crowd can gather, and that's what happened. There was a couple thousand people out there that heard the word and, and, and were there. And this is um, <coughs> around the altar again. We, we were there many times. And yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, uh, just enjoying the presence of God. And you're going to see that uh, you're going to experience a little bit of that in, in, in just a second because there's a little piece of a video that, that uh, right, happened right in the middle of when I was preaching. The place just erupted. Uh, and I was, uh, I don't even remember the word I was, <laughs> I, was, I was preaching, but I was testifying about where God had brought me from. And some of them knew, the brothers and sisters from Chitipa knew, uh, that what I was saying was true because they knew me before when I walked on a cane and I went there and all this and I was, you know, and now <laughs> I'm running and dancing and hooting and hollering and all the rest, but, <clears throat> you know, and so they know, they see what God has done in me and they just reacted. Right in the middle of my preaching, they just erupted. The place just erupted. And once you get, once you get them going, that's it. It's like you can't tell them, all right, now sit down, be good. <laughs> you just got to let God do his thing. Let him have his way, and uh, he can do it much better than we can anyway. So I'm like, okay, Lord, just do your thing. Go ahead. <laughs> and uh, he did. He did a wonderful and miraculous thing. Are you, do you have those two? Uh, there's, there's two pictures I got coming back on the bus. You go through this game reserve where the animals are there, with the giraffes and the, and the uh, I forget what they are, the other ones were. You didn't grab them? Well, you'll have to blame him. They're there. <laughs> you can go on my Facebook and see them, though. I only got two pictures because we're in a bus. 
and it was kind of hard to take, but I got two pictures. I saw a bunch of giraffes, which I love giraffes. And so I got to see giraffes, and there were zebras, but I wasn't quick enough to get them. And then there were like these antelope things. Uh, I don't know if that's what they're called, but they look like antelopes with you know, horns and all the rest. <laughs> and uh, I took pictures of them. But are we at the, the point where the video is? OK. And you're going to see, hopefully, oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> Pastors will get in the back there. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was, it was crazy. That was, uh, for more than an hour, they worshiped God and they, they praised God and shouted until they couldn't shout anymore. And, and uh, <clears throat> I lost my voice. <laughs> I found it very difficult to preach after that. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was crazy, really crazy. It was an absolutely wonderful. I mean, they're, they're not even words that you that can describe. It, it's so um, so difficult to express what what I actually felt and what what I experienced there, and all that God did um, changed me. I mean, ah, and I just got a glimpse of what it means to walk in some of this, and it makes you hungry for more. <laughs> And it doesn't matter what you have to go through, the troubles, the trials, the obstacles, and all of the rest. The enemy is defeated. And the only right reason that he tries to, to take your focus and to rob you and, and to stop you is because he knows the power of God. <laughs> Once people get the word in them and God changes them, they burn, especially Africans. <clears throat> and now he has a whole bunch of little evangelists out there who are on fire under the, the anointing of God. And so now it makes his job more difficult, you see. <clears throat> and so that's why he's just doing what he's supposed to do. But if we're honest, anybody who's been through will say, you know, if the devil had any sense, he'd have left us alone. <laughs> because it just makes you stronger. Gives you more determination than ever. Whatever he does, and whatever obstacle or trial or difficulty you face, just does something inside of you to push you on, makes you desire even more to do and to be what God has called you to do and to be. So if he had any sense, he really would have left us alone to begin with, and he wouldn't have tried so hard because he just lights us on fire. Uh, <clears throat> and God uses that. God uses the enemy to light a fire under those he loves to cause you to press in even more, to cause you to persevere even more. He can use anything and anyone to bring about his desired plan and purpose. And he does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
praise his holy name. So it was, it was amazing. Awesome, wonderful, breathtaking. Uh, and I look forward, my brother said, I'm, miraculously when I was there, the last morning that I was there just before service, about five in the morning, God spoke to me and told me that he was going to open a door to Kenya. And there were a number of nations, five other nations and, and that he mentioned, and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, that's interesting. I'm like, okay, you know. But it had been two years since he spoke that word to me, and I went to Tanzania. So I'm thinking, okay, yeah, all right, it's coming. But I never expected when I got home that the invitation would come and that God would miraculously open the door and that I'd be going back so quickly. Uh, and God has opened the door for us to go in May. And as it happens, we're going through Uganda, which is also in the plan and purpose of God because another brother, when, when my brother and I were praying about this trip, this coming trip to, to Kenya, I'm praying, how do we get there? Where do I go? I don't know which way, you know. We, re we really need specific direction because it's like 12 hours from Nairobi. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, there's only one airport and it's going to be another bus ride or something, you know, from, from there. But it happens that we are very close to Uganda where this uh, conference is going to be. And Entebbe, oh, which is the capital district in Uganda, is about two and a half hours from there. So it's very close. So we actually go in. So I'm thinking to myself, <clears throat> when God began to to speak Uganda, and I'm thinking maybe we should look into Uganda. Maybe flying in there would be easier. And so I'm like, oh, I don't know how this is going to work with visas and all the rest, because then I'm going to have to get a visa for Uganda and another visa for Kenya. And, you know, it can be very expensive, especially multiple entries and all of this. And so we had made it a matter of prayer. And uh, while I was, uh, got, got a message from the bishop there in Kenya who in, invited me, while I was talking with him on Messenger, I got another message from a brother that I didn't know with a word that spoke directly in, into the situation. And the word was, and he knows the way that I take. And God wanted me to just tell you that he's got you. And that he has made the way before you. And I'm like, who? I don't even know this guy. He is from Uganda. Just the next city over the line in Uganda to where I'm going for the conference. Just happened, you know, <laughs> to, be, to be there. And uh, I'm like, man, this scripture that he gave to me and, and spoke to me. I'm like, brother, you don't even know. I don't even know who you are, but you don't even know. He said, I was just praying, and the Spirit of God told me to send you this message. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. He said, I actually, I am friends with somebody who is friends with you. And I saw some pictures, and your face came to me while I was praying, and the Spirit said, send him a message. And this is what I want you to tell him. And I said, you are from Uganda? And he says, yes, I live in, you know, and he told me the name of the place. And I'm like, do you know where Entebbe is? And, and, and talking with him, and he says, oh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, within two hours from Entebbe. It's International Airport. This is the capital district. And very close to where I am. Uh, I'm very familiar with Entebbe. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, okay, Lord. I said, because my brother and I were, were praying for direction, and all of a sudden you send me this word, and you are from there. And I said, I, I'm thinking that God is going to have us come in through, through Uganda, through Entebbe. <clears throat> and he says, oh, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Go and, go and look up the, the information, because I said I need to find out about Visa and all of the rest. He said, go and look up the information. So I went on. And do you know in December... When I was in Tanzania, when God spoke to me, they changed the rules for the visa. And now is, there's an East African visa. One visa. 
that you can travel in any of the East African nations, there are four that are in this uh, confederacy, this confederate of nations. Uh, there's Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and it will be uh, Tanzania. Tanzania is the last to, to come on board. Uh, but they will within a few months. And so you can travel to any one of these countries for one visa, 100 US, and obtain an East African visa that will allow you to travel into any of these nations uninhibited, multiple entry. You can go from one to the next to the next on one visa. Hallelujah. This is, a, this is a miracle for anybody who's traveled, brother. For anybody who has traveled. And I said, this is a, this is a godsend. This is a, a, this is a wonderful gift to missionaries. And I can see the furtherance of the gospel. God, you're in control. And this just took place in, in December. When I was praying, God was working. He said, God, I've got this. God, God is saying, I've got this. Don't worry all about it. I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to blow your mind because you're not going to. And he does. He blows your mind. So then the next thing, so I go back the next day, very excited after praying again with, because we pray every, every night at midnight, my brother and I from Africa, uh, because it's eight hours difference, and it's eight in the morning for him, beginning his day, and it's ending mine. Uh, and, and we pray together for our upcoming time or for whatever the God had puts on our spirit. And so I was sharing with him, you know, we were very excited about this visa and all of us. So I said, we see the hand of God in opening the door to Uganda. And I said, I don't know what God is going to do because I still don't know transportation and all of the rest. So I come on the, the, the next morning after I rested and all the rest, and this brother is on there again. And he's saying, praise God, I'm so excited. We were pray I was praying together with my family about your coming. God began to speak to me. And pastor, I don't know how you're traveling, but God spoke to me. And he said, ah, I want to tell you, I don't know how, who's going to pick you from the airport, how you're tra being transported, but he said, I will, I will meet you and carry you from the time of your arrival. I will take you to the conference. I will be with you at the conference, and I will return you home. And your entire stay, he said, if you will allow, your entire stay will be paid by us. And, and even your accommodation. And he said, I hope and pray that you will, you will be able to be with us in Uganda, either prior to your going to Kenya or just after your going. And I said, it's, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Uh, and I said, I, I would love to be your guest and, and all of the rest. And there are some other surprises and things that he, you know, he, he had told me about and all of the rest. And he works for the Department of Tourism <laughs> there in Uganda. And so he has security and all of this, you know. And so I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Because we, one of the things we were worried about was going through Nairobi. Because, you know, there's been a lot of attacks in Nairobi and all of the rest. And uh, God said, don't worry about that. You ain't got to worry about that. That's hours and hours away. I've got another plan and a purpose for you. <laughs> and God is just going before, already, already going before us and making the way before us. And last night I was on the <laughs> messenger again with my brother from Uganda. And I said, God is showing me something about young people in in Uganda, there's something, and he says, yes, I have been to, I, I don't know what the name of it is, but to the national leaders in, in, in the Christian leaders, and he said, we are talking about having a crusade of young people coming together at, you know, at, when you, upon your return to Uganda, and he said, we want to get as many young people as we can to hear the word uh, as you're coming back from, from Kenya. And I was just like, wow. So, and, and I said, you know, I saw this. And I said, God spoke to me out of Joel chapter 2. And I said, you know, this is one we were praying. God spoke to the, this, your sons and daughters will prophesy and, and all of the rest. And God began to show me some things. And I said, God knows the way. 
and he's preparing the way already before us. And uh, I have a, a feeling that what happens in Uganda after the fact is going to be greater than what happens in Kenya before the fact. I'm, I'm just very excited about what God is unfolding. And uh, every day, walking with him is an adventure. It really is a life-changing, altering adventure. Uh, but when we give ourselves, and every one of us, it's not just for missionaries, not just for pastors, but he calls all of us to know him in that way, to desire him in that way, so that we can be effective here, because there are people that you can reach that I can't. There are people that you rub shoulders with every single day that God wants to touch and he wants to bring in. There are family members and loved ones and people in your schools that God wants you to be empowered by him to reach for his honor and for his glory. And we all need this. We all need to walk in that power and that anointing. And God has planned that we are alive in this day for this very reason. This is why we've been called, that we'd show forth his glory. Not in our strength, in your strength, my strength, we fall, we fail. But I'm grateful that it's not in our strength because my strength is limited. My strength is faulty. I get tired. I get weak. But God, he never tires. His strength, his anointing can overcome any barrier. Nothing is impossible with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. It's been wonderful again. Amen. Let's all stand in closing today. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you, Father, for hearing your word today. Now, as we go, Lord, let your word become part of our being. And, Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, be with us as we go our separate ways till we meet again tomorrow night for prayer. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit and your presence will come on Monday night prayer and also Wednesday night. Be with your people. Bless their going in, they're coming out, they're lying down, they're rising up. And give them traveling mercies, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. fellowship with one another before you leave.